glad to have uh, some of our Berean family together tonight again for a Bible study. What we usually do, if anybody else is tuning in, we're glad to have you too. We start about 6 o'clock and we go to around 7.15 or thereabouts. And we've been in a long study with regard to the prophetic times in which we're living and what is still yet to come on this earth. I can't review everything that we have done for approximately the past year, but I can pick it up at a certain point, especially so if you have your Bibles with you, which is exceedingly important, since we have in the Bible the living Word of God written for us so that from Genesis all the way through Revelation, we have the plan of God unfolded in stages so that we can understand our where we fit into history uh, so far as the Church of Jesus Christ is concerned, what plans God has yet for the nation of Israel, and everything is working out according to what the Word of God says. When we think about what our country and the different nations of the world have been facing with this virus, it gives us a bit of a foretaste of things that are going to come in a period of time that Jeremiah calls Jacob's trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. In the 30th chapter of Jeremiah at verse 7, we are told that there is going to come a time on the earth when there will be a level of suffering such as has never before been experienced by humanity. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who inspired the Old Testament, of course, verbally, we see validating that very thing as he refers to it in the 24th chapter of Matthew as a time that there will be such trouble there was never anything like it before nor will there be anything ever equivalent to it afterwards. And so this period of seven years as defined by the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks, 400 total 90 years, 490 total years, I should say, are determined upon the people of Israel, according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27. 69 of those weeks uh, have been fulfilled for Israel in the cutting off of the Messiah when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. There is one week of years yet remaining, a seven-year period that will be divided into two periods of 1,260 days each, or three and a half years, and then a second three and a half years, also defined in the Bible as 42 months, and then a second period of 42 months. That time has been set apart for God to specifically work with the people of Israel to wake them up as a nation to the fact that they missed their Messiah in his first coming. The whole Old Testament breathes the message of the sacrifice that God would offer on behalf of this whole world because of our sinful problem. All of the lambs and the sheep and the bullocks that were offered in the Old Testament, when they were offered according to the Word of God and by faith with regard to the offerer, would give a picture of one who was to come as the true Lamb of God who would fulfill all those Old Testament offerings in one sacrifice, 
for the six hours that our Lord Jesus spent on that cross and accomplish that work of eternal redemption, winning the forgiveness of our sins, winning for us eternal life, totally putting sin into the place of defeat, defeating Satan and also the, the demons and the whole realm of darkness. And he declared, it is finished. And it remains finished. It was a once for all work. No more sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ in reference to sin. And the Bible says one day he's actually coming back to earth in his second coming in which he is going to set up a thousand year kingdom where he will reign on this earth. But prior to his setting up of that kingdom, we have that seven year period in which God is going to deal with the nation of Israel where the Jewish people are going to come to the end of themselves. Every strategy, every moral deed they believe that they have done, every good thing is going to be revealed as having been done on their own to build themselves up, to make their own way of salvation, and that's an impossibility because no one can get from where we are given our sinful condition that includes gentiles and jews to get to where the holy god is on our own there is no way one had to do the work for us and there's only one who could qualify and that is the sinless son of god the one who is god manifest in the flesh and so the design of God is to bring Israel to their knees there will be no way out evil is going to get worse and worse the church in this age in which we're living right now will begin to fall away from the Lord Jesus Christ more and more until the Lord at the end of this age in which we're living, takes the church out of this world, the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, no longer restrains the advancement of evil, and things will unfold in that seven years where the Antichrist will come to full power over this earth by the midpoint of that seven years of tribulation. These are all things that are to be found in the scripture uh, in the different prophetic books such as Ezekiel and Daniel, Zechariah. We find it in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And again, we find it in Mark 13 and in Luke 17 and chapter 21. And then again, in the two Thessalonian epistles, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, these are not the only places, of course, but then also in the book of Jude, which is one chapter, and then also in the book of Revelation. The things that we want to be concerned about for tonight's study is to take a look at our current circumstances and to have you and me think together about what has happened with regard to things that used to be available in the grocery store and the way not only here in America but also in most of the nations of the world there has been panic buying. And this is based just on one virus compared to the plagues that are going to unfold in the beginning of that seven-year tribulation and will begin to unfold throughout the extent of the full seven years of trouble that is, that is coming upon this earth. God will not only deal with the Jewish people during that time to bring them to their Messiah, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 
but also God is going to be dealing with Gentile nations who have refused him and rebelled against him, and we're still on a planet Earth where the nations of this world are in rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to go back a little ways in our study with regard to our own group. We had uh, left off with studying how there are going to be a grouping of, of four different uh, nations, or not just four different nations, but four different groups of nations that are going to come and attack the nation of Israel in the end times. We see these things already forming today, and Ezekiel chapter 38 talks, first of all, about a northern coalition of nations that will be led by Russia and partnered with Russia will be Iran and Turkey and other nations uh, that will be included in that coalition and then also uh, will include Syria and Lebanon. As they are going to come down from the north, Ezekiel indicates in chapter 38 that they are going to eye the land of Israel and see all of their resources, many of which are still to be discovered, even though many have already, such as the Leviathan gas field and others, and we expect them yet to discover oil, according to what we believe the Bible says. And so nations that are in need of these materials are going to get it into their mind that they are going to attack the Jewish people. God is going to intervene in all of that, and Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that five-sixths of that army that comes from the north will be destroyed by God. One-sixth will be left. I have a, a very simple picture here, and I wish I were uh, sophisticated enough and set up well enough to be able to have some overheads that would allow us to see what I'm trying to show here in a very, very small picture that we have used in our group study on Sunday night. Up here to uh, your left, my right, in the green color indicates the nations that are connected with Europe and really the whole Western coalition of nations which I personally believe is going to involve North America and to some extent perhaps even South America. And these nations are going to form together and they are going to be the main foundation for this person called the Antichrist to be able to rise to power. And the thing that is going to give him authority over the whole world as God allows this to develop is going to be the economic power that he is going to be able to wield in this world, even to the point where halfway through the tribulation, people will have to receive a mark uh, concerning this beast or this antichrist on the palm of their right hand or in their forehead. Uh, this is going to give uh, the antichrist uh, massive capability uh, things that perhaps are beyond even what our supercomputers can do today uh, as our scientists move us into a field of which I have little or no understanding, which is the field of quantum computing. And our supercomputers today are going to maybe look like the Apple IIe the way it was back in 1984. And so the ability to be able to trace the movement of individuals on this globe is going to be unprecedented. And so we need to keep in mind that that's where things are going now. And the, uh, the people who have panicked, which is essentially the whole world, uh, concerning the contagious nature of this virus and all the buying that they did and stripping of the shelves from grocery stores 
is going to be magnified, magnified beyond anything that we can imagine with regard to the trouble that is going to unfold with the plagues that are going to hit one right after another. And uh, we are given in the book of Revelation 10, or excuse me, seven seals uh, that will unfold, and the seventh seal will open the door for seven trumpet judgments, and the seventh trumpet will open up the door for seven bowl judgments to come upon this earth. And these things will happen prior to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ back to earth. From about the midpoint of the tribulation, there is going to be an unfolding of a campaign. A lot of people, uh, in reference to the Bible, refer to the Battle of Armageddon which is going to be fought towards the end of that seven-year period. However, the word for battle is not the usual word in the Greek. The actual word that is being used there refers to a campaign that is made up of a series of battles that will climax uh, at Armageddon or in the territory of Jezreel, which is a valley area where we have a, approximately a 20 mile width and around uh, 55 miles long. A, a beautiful place uh, where more wars have been fought than on any other uh, piece of land uh, on the earth. It is the most blood-soaked piece of land uh, in the history of the world. And that's where that final conflagration is going to take place as the nations once again come to try to exterminate the Jewish people, every last one of them. God is not going to allow that to happen, and it's going to be at that point when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to intervene and come back to this earth and destroy those who have rebelled against him and who have the design of destroying his plan with the people of Israel. So the Western Coalition of Nations will be the original platform on which the Antichrist is going to rise to power. There's going to be a Southern Coalition of Nations that will be made up of Libya and the Sudan and to some extent Egypt at some point. And uh, then uh, that will act as a pincer movement to seemingly entrap Israel which is a tiny little black dot, only the size of New Jersey. And yet, the people of Israel have so developed miraculously uh, under God's allowance uh, in the fields of technology and medicine and also in an arsenal for warfare <clears throat> that is an amazing thing to see. Through the wars that have been fought since the 1948 establishment of the people of Israel, a war in 1956 and again in 1967 where they were able to extend their holdings of land that God originally gave to them anyhow, but people of this world deny that that belongs to Israel, and yet God declares that that's his land, and uh, that's the land that belongs to his people Israel. And um, then um, we see that uh, in addition uh, to this northern coalition and southern coalition, the Antichrist is going to have some say in this. And at the midpoint of the tribulation, he is going to bring in his armies and establish them there in the land of Israel. At the beginning of the seven years, he will have made or actually confirmed a covenant. He's made a, making a covenant that was there with Israel and making it firmer, establishing it to be stronger, uh, making it greater is the way the text reads in the original. And the amazing thing that he is going to do at that point, that Antichrist, is to enter into this third temple that will be built by that time and he is going to set himself up as God and call himself God. And 
then he is going to unleash uh, as he becomes Satan and dwelt with such a stream of terror uh, that the world has never known before. And if it were not for the intervention of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the end of those seven years, there would not be any Jewish people left on this earth. And that is the goal of the devil who hates the Lord Jesus Christ, hates the Jewish people, hates the Jewish Messiah. And uh, that is going to be what is finally going to wake Israel up when they have no choice with them being backed into a corner. They are going to look up and look for to God for deliverance and guess who's going to appear in the heavens it'll be what the Bible calls the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens Isaiah in the 64th chapter talks uh, about uh, expressing a prayer oh that God would rend the heavens and come down and the Lord will answer that prayer in every detail. And the skies are going to part away like a scroll, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens when the Antichrist is about to deal the final blow, along with the other nations of the world, against the Jewish people. And so... We go to Ezekiel 38, for instance. We can't look at all the details uh, of this now. Uh, we can read it uh, at another time. But this is more tonight of just giving a review of where uh, our people have been as we've opened our Bibles together and actually read uh, the details of it. But Ezekiel 38 tracks the Northern Coalition of Nations and then we find out in Daniel chapter 11 that uh, he refers also to a northern coalition, a southern coalition of nations. And then we find out that the Antichrist is going to be coming in from the West, whether he sets up headquarters in Europe, which seems likely. Uh, the old Roman Empire is going to be reformed and recast in a new version and the Bible makes these things clear enough for us and then uh, according to Revelation chapter 9 there are going to be armies that will be coming from the east and that are certainly going to be led by China and the number in Revelation of those troops and all of their military hardware is given to us and the number is 200 million now the Chinese could easily put an army together like that even currently but what I find fascinating at this point is that China that has gone ahead to make all kinds of deals with uh, different nations Iran in particular and also Italy and Iran has opened themselves up to it, and so has Italy. Uh, the places, so far at least anyhow, that seem to have been hit the hardest with this virus is not only China, but also Iran and also Italy. It's just very interesting in the way God is controlling things and also allowing things to develop at this point. I firmly believe that we're living in the last days of the church age. None of us could ever predict the day or the hour of the coming of the Lord to seize the church and catch the church out of the world to meet the Lord in the air and take the church back to heaven with himself where we're going to face, as the Bible calls it in Romans chapter 14, and again, in 1 Corinthians 3, and uh, again also in 1 Corinthians 11. And uh, it is going to be the judgment seat of Christ, where believers are going to be judged according to 
the works that we've done since we've been born again. Those works have nothing to contribute to our salvation. Our salvation is all of the Lord Jesus. It's free. Uh, it was earned by our Savior only through his shed blood and the sacrifice that, that he gave of himself there at the cross as he poured out his life on behalf of us, bearing our sins, as 1 Peter 2.24 says, bearing our sins in his own body upon that tree. And so what you and I have as people who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior is to look forward to all of these events that are coming because God has designed things in such a way that for those who know the Savior, our final destination is to be with Christ, not only in heaven, but also here on his kingdom on earth. And then according to Revelation 21 and 22, to also bring us into the new heavens and new earth that is going to be created. And the beauty of this world is one thing, but the beauty of that world that is yet to come is something that we can only think about in light of just those two chapters mainly in Scripture. We have so much for which we can thank the Lord. And uh, as I said before, I don't think you could probably see very well on that sheet of paper, but everything that we've talked about we can find in the Scripture. And uh, I would uh, like to read in the book of Zechariah some of the things that are going to happen we read chapter 12 to begin with it says there in verse 1 the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel saith the Lord who stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him there's just another confirmation of the book of Genesis and the historical nature of those chapters. We don't have poetry there. We have an actual account of God's creation. He stretches forth the heavens. It's interesting that our scientists are trying to find out um, what the constitution of dark matter may be. In fact, they're not even sure necessarily that it exists, but they, they believe that there has to be some kind of energy there or something that is pushing the universe outward still and it's just fascinating for those of us who know scripture and certainly may not have any uh, expertise with regard to astronomy nevertheless the scripture is saying right here it's the lord who stretches forth the heavens it says that also in the book of the psalms um I'm not sure exactly which psalm right at the moment but um uh, in 102 and Psalm 104, um, I think we'll find it in, in one of those, uh, which I'm not going to turn to at this point. Um, it's something that you can look up and then uh, uh, if you want to make a comment and let me know which is which. But uh, there's a number of places where it says that the Lord stretches forth the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. And then here's God's warning concerning Jerusalem, where they want to divide that city again. The Jewish people believe that never again will anything happen to them like the Holocaust of World War II. I was born in 1943, and my dad went off to war in 1944 when I was a little over a year old. I can remember those years distinctly vivid memories even though uh, at the time I was between uh, 15 months old and two and a half years old but I can remember my dad's picture I can remember kneeling with my mom and uh, praying together uh, I can I can also uh, remember kissing my dad's picture uh, before I went to bed uh, at night and uh, the world was gripped by such uh, ferocity uh, with that war. Uh, so many died from so many different countries, including our America that gave up so much in order 
to help uh, work a rescue operation for uh, nations that were uh, under the tyranny uh, of the uh, German regime uh, and uh, the Nazi regime and also uh, that of Italy. And my dad fought through Sicily all the way up through Italy and uh, the Lord kept him safe for a two-year period uh, as he fought for our country. But uh, the Jewish people believe that they will never, ever have to go through something like that again because they are going to remain so vigilant about it. But the fact of the matter is, it's sad to talk about it, but they are going to face something that is far, far worse than what was happening there in that Holocaust. The Bible talks about it. These are Jewish books of the Bible. The Bible is a Jewish resource. Uh, from Genesis through Revelation. And everything we have here is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that moved these writers along. And uh, they wrote down exactly what God wanted them to record for our purposes so we can understand. And uh, so this goes on to say now, because everything in reference to the Jewish people uh, has... Uh, gone right down to the detail of what God said would happen in this world. And so verse 2 of Zechariah 12 says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, God says, Will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Remember what we said earlier? There's going to come a time when all the nations of the world will gather there in that valley of Armageddon. And at that point, uh, when the Antichrist Christ believes he's going to be fighting against uh, armies uh, from the east and a residue ar of armies from the north and uh, some armies from the south, all together, all these nations are going to see the heavens split apart and they're going to see the Son of Man coming back to earth with all the Old Testament saints, all the believers of the church age. That'll include you and me if you really know Christ as Savior. And the Bible tells us that the Lord is going to win a wonderful victory over all this rebellion. And the Lord is going to establish Israel and Jerusalem, which will become the capital of the world. He will establish Israel once again at the head of the nations. In the 14th chapter of Zechariah, as we get to the point where we're going to close for right now, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. This is Zechariah 14, verse 1. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken. And the houses rifled or robbed. Women will be raped. Half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut, or shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And then this wonderful verse, and we're going to be participants in this very event. Verse 4 says, And his feet. That is the feet of the Son of God, the feet of the Son of Man, the eternal Son of God, uncreated from everlasting to everlasting, is coming back to earth in his resurrected body. And his feet shall literally stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, 
and half of it toward the south. And at that point, the Jewish people that are remaining, just a remnant of them, are going to flee down that valley that will be created by the second coming of our Lord when his feet touch that Mount of Olives. It's going to be after that when the Lord judges Israel and judges the nations of this world that the kingdom will be readied and prepared. And then we read in verse 9 of Zechariah 14, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. And contrary to what our Jewish friends think about those who are born-again believers, we believe in one God, eternally revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the truth of that is going to dawn upon the Jewish people only after the majority of them have had to go through such a terrible time to give them the wake-up call that they need. In the meantime, there are Jewish people at different places understanding it already and coming to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know if there's very few listening to uh, this message or if there's more than a few. But I would just appeal to you that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the most important decision you can ever make is to open up your life. Be sorry for the sin that is in you because there's sin in every one of us. So we're no different in that way. And to tell the Lord how sorry you are for that sin and how glad you are that he took that sin to the cross and totally defeated that sin and turns around in the accomplishment of what he did at the cross and offers to you free because it cannot be earned. He earned it. We don't deserve it. He's the one who tells us that he loves us and he loves us with an unconditional love. But we have to come to him, trust him as our personal savior. The Lord God Almighty cannot allow sin to dwell in the eternal heavens. And the Lord cannot allow sin to exist in his presence. We know that Satan has access into glory right now. But in chapter 12 of Revelation, Satan is going to be cast out to the earth. It's going to be that midpoint of the tribulation when the Antichrist will be indwelt by the devil. But from our perspective right now, from your personal viewpoint, the most important thing you can do for the rest of your time on earth and for your whole eternity is to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to become your personal Savior. And he will do that. I wouldn't be on here talking about it if I did not really believe that myself and if I didn't know that many, many years ago when I was 14 years old, I felt a crushing weight of sin in my own life. And when I heard uh, Billy Graham at that particular time uh, talking on TV about the matter of our sin and the, the depths of our sin, of uh, how it hit me and how I saw that, that I needed the one who alone is the Savior of the world. And I asked him to come into my heart and my life at that point. And things have been different ever since. There have been challenges, there have been trouble, there have been failures, there's been sin. But you know something? There is eternal life. There is the forgiveness of my sins. And I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that is told to me in Colossians chapter 3, where I am hidden with God in Christ Jesus, and that is a combination that no one can break, 
not even you, not even me, in the worst of our failures, our Lord Jesus Christ has freely given to us that victory that he won, putting to our account his righteousness. That position that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ will never end. It will always be true of us. I can only hope and pray that as I close this time of Bible study together that you will consider carefully about receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Heavenly Father, we come before you and, and praise you and thank you again for some time that we could spend in the Word of God. We feel so limited, Lord, on this forum uh, to be able to communicate effectively. But I just pray with all my heart that for any who would be listening and watching, that if they need the Lord Jesus as their Savior, they would open up their heart and their life and accept you into their heart and life and discover what a transformation actually takes place. What, what an exhilarating sense of liberty it is to know that we've been set free from sin and the power of sin, all because of what Christ has once for all accomplished at the cross. Lord, may there be many who claim that in Christ. And we pray this. In our Savior's precious name, amen.